Okay, let's try to start the session. Welcome to my session with the title The Dangerous Value of Bookmark Lookups. Who of you knows bookmark lookups? Who likes them? Okay. Who has already attended a session of mine over the last days? So almost everybody is uh, skipping my introduction and we are just going into the agenda. In the first step, I want to give you a general introduction what a bookmark lookup is in SQL Server, why we need bookmark lookups, why they are great. And afterwards, I just want to show you multiple problems why bookmark lookups are very, very bad in SQL Server. We will talk about the so-called dipping point, we will talk about parameter sniffing, and at the very end I will also talk about so-called bookmark lookup deadlocks. Let's start with the bookmark lookup itself. A bookmark lookup always occurs in SQL Server when we have an execution plan in front of us and the query optimizer has chosen to access our data through a non-clustered index. Non-clustered index is just a secondary index which we have defined on some columns of our database table. Means when we are accessing more data, data that isn't part of that non-clustered index, SQL Server has to access our base table. And that's a so-called bookmark lookup in SQL Server. SQL Server supports two kinds of bookmark lookups. A bookmark lookup on a heap table. A heap table is a table without a clustered index. It's just a heap of unordered, unstructured data. And in addition, SQL Server also supports a so-called clustered key lookup. means a bookmark lookup on a clustered table, a table which has a clustered index defined on it. Normally we are saying that bookmark lookups are very, very good because we can create a very flexible indexing strategy. But as you will see in that session, bookmark lookups can be very, very dangerous because they are leading to various side effects, mainly performance problems. For that reason, we have to identify bookmark lookups which are bad, which are dangerous, and we have to resolve those bookmark lookups. What we can do, for example, is to create a so-called covering index. A covering index is just a non-clustered index which contains all the columns, all the information that we are requesting in our query. Means. With a current non-clustered index, we can eliminate bookmark lookups. The side effect of a covering index is that we are duplicating some columns. When we are including columns in the non-clustered index, those columns are stored in our base table, in our clustered table, or in our heap table, and in addition, in our covering non-clustered index. Means when we are changing these columns very, very often, like the last modified date, we are introducing a white overhead because SQL Server has to change these columns to dance once in our base table and once inside our non-clustered index. That's the double-edged sword of indexing. We are improving read performance, we are degrading white performance. Okay, so we have always to find a very good balance where we have a good read and write performance in SQL Server. So SQL Server, in, SQL Server supports the so-called include property and with the include property we can include in the leaf level of our non-clustered index additional columns to overcome the problem of a bookmark lookup. Let's have a look on that. I'm using here the AdventureWorks 2012 database and I'm enabling the session option statistics IO so that SQL Server is telling us how many page reads we have for a specific query. When we are making performance tuning on SQL Server we have only one goal. 
make our queries faster by reducing the page reads that we need for a specific query. <coughs> I'm including the actual execution plan and I'm running here a simple select statement against the table database log. That's a heap table, a table without, class, without the clustered index. So as you can see, the query optimizer has chosen a non-clustered index to retrieve the column database log ID on which we are restricting. And in addition, we have requested the column database user. That column isn't part of that non-clustered index, so SQL Server has to perform a row identifier lookup on our heap table to retrieve this additional information. When you have a bookmark lookup in your execution plan, both information always joined together through a nested loop operator. So SQL Server isn't able to introduce a merge join or hash join here. You will always have a nested loop in combination with a bookmark lookup. I see a simple query which performs a bookmark lookup on a clustered table. As you can see, with an index non-clustered to retrieve all the email addresses. In our case, we are getting here 19 email addresses. Means, for every record, SQL Server has to perform that bookmark lookup. So you can see numbers of executions 19 times. For every record, we are just making a bookmark lookup to retrieve additional information, like in our case, the modified data. This means the more records we are returning, the more inefficient that bookmark lookup will get. As we will see later, SQL Server implements here a safety net for us. At some point, the query optimizer decides that execution plan is inefficient, the execution plan is discarded, and SQL Server makes something different. Another query. I'm returning state province IDs of 42. 42 is always the answer. We can see we are getting the address ID, our logical pointer. We have the state province ID as a seek predicate, and in addition, we are requesting the color modified date. Modified date isn't part of that non cluster, so SQL Server again introduces a bookmark lookup. When we are looking on our page reads, you can see we have 18 logical reads. So we have read 18 pages of 8 kilobytes directly from the buffer pool, the in-memory cache of SQL Server. If we want now to eliminate that bookmark lookup, we can create a covering non-clustered index. In our case, we are just including the common modified date in the leaf level of a non-clustered index means SQL Server can eliminate that bookmark lookup because every information that we are requesting is afterwards part of that non-clustered index. As you can see, in the navigation structure of the non-clustered, we have the column state province ID. In that column, we can make very, very efficient seed operations. And in the leaf level, we are just including the column modified data. We are duplicating that column. That column is once part of our clustered index, and additionally, it's part of that non-clustered index. Means when we are changing that column very, very often, we are introducing wide overhead. SQL Server has to change that column in two places. Of course, when we are rerunning that query, we're getting back the same result with a completely different execution plan. Index seek non-clustered means every information that we have requested is part of that non-clustered index, so we have eliminated the book, that bookmark lookup. And guess what? Two logical reads instead of 18. That's a huge improvement. Just think about larger tables, larger queries. Of course, when we are making an update on the column modified date, we have introduced the wide overhead. Because SQL Server has to change that column in the clustered table and in addition in the non-cluster that we have created previously. Make sense? So just a general introduction to bookmark lookups. <coughs> 
as I have said, SQL Server has to perform that bookmark lookup for every record that we're returning. Imagine you're returning from a query 80,000 records from a non-clustered index. This means we have to perform that bookmark lookup 80,000 times for every record over and over and over and over again. Means such an execution plan gets very, very, very inefficient. For that reason, SQL Server implements a so-called tipping point. The tipping point defines if it makes sense to make a bookmark lookup in our execution plan or if it makes sense to scan our whole table and discard non-qualifying rows. The tipping point is somewhere between one-fourth and one-third of the data pages that we are reading. We are talking here about data pages. A page in SQL Server is always 8 kilobytes large. So the tipping point doesn't depend on the number of records. The size of the records defines how many pages we are reading. This means the smaller your records are, the more records you can fit onto one page, the more earlier the tipping point will be. So SQL Server that says, when we are reading less than one-fourth, we want one-third of pages for that specific query. It's fine to make a bookmark lookup. If we are reading more pages, it's more efficient to make a complete table or clustered index scan and just discard non-qualifying rows. So you have a non-clustered index defined on your search predicate column and SQL Server scans your whole table and you are thinking, Hey, what is the query optimizer doing? I have an almost good non-clustered index, and that non-clustered index is just ignored by SQL Server. Imagine with a table with 80,000 records. The first step, every record is 4,000 bytes long, means we can store two records on one page of 8 kilobytes. This means our dipping point is somewhere between 12 and 17% of the records. So we can read a huge amount of records from that table, around, let's say, 8 to 10,000. Imagine we are again dealing with 80,000 records, but every record is only 40 bytes long. Very, very small. In that case, our dipping point is somewhere between 0.12 and 0.17%. You're just reading a few rows from that table and SQL Server doesn't use your non-clustered index. Your non-clustered index is just useless. Just think about that. Because it's an almost good non-clustered index. A very good non-clustered index is a covering non-clustered index which includes every information that we are requesting in that specific query. Let's have a look on that. I'm creating here a simple table. Every record is 400 bytes long, means we can store 20 records on one database of 8 kilobytes. I'm creating a unique class of index and I'm inserting 80,000 records into that table. Takes 30 seconds. Any questions in the meantime? You are already impressed. <laughs> wow. You're a very easy audience. What about the large objects? You can't include them. You can only include up to 900 bytes. So if you have uh, LOB data types, you have to perform a bookmark worker. So we are finished. We have inserted 80,000 records. We create a non-clustered index on the common value. We include our execution plan. When we make a simple select star statement, we are getting a clustered index scan. And as you can see, the clustered index scan takes 4,016 logical reads. 
We have no idea where we 4,000 pages, means our dipping point is somewhere between 1,000 and 1,333 pages. We have 80,000 records in that table, so the dipping point is somewhere between 1.2 and 1.7% of the rules. Running here a simple query, returning the first 1,062 records from that table. I'm using here the column value, we have a non classic index defined on it, select star, we will request an additional information, so SQL Server has to perform a bookmark lookup. As you can see, we are getting back 1062 rows, actual numbers of rows, means for every row we have to perform that bookmark lookup. Means we are for every <coughs> row we need additional page reads. So in that case, we have 3265 page reads. Think about that. A complete scan of the table costs us 4016 page reads. For that reason, we have the dipping point. Same query again. I'm just returning one more record. Different execution plan. Clustered index scan. We're scanning the whole table and we're just discounting for a residual predicate non qualifying rules to get a constant performance of 4016 page rules. That's a huge problem. You have two queries with two different execution plans. What you don't have anymore is a so-called plan stability. That's a really pain in the ass when we talk later about stored procedures. Because your first generated plan gets cached and reused, parameter sniffing. That's a really, really bad problem in SQL Server. You have no plan stability anymore. You have no control which plan gets first cached in SQL Server. Another table. Every record is 40 bytes long. So we can fit now 200 records on one page with very, very small records. Again, I'm creating a unique clustered index, and again, I'm inserting 80,000 records. We're still working with the same amount of records, but every record is only 40 bytes long instead of 400 bytes. Means our dipping point moves forward. We can only read around 1.12, uh, 0 0.12 to 0 0.17% of rows from that table. Around 160 rows out of 80,000. And afterwards, SQL Server will discard our non clustered index. Your non clustered index is just useless. Think about that. <coughs> we create our non clustered, select star. We need page reads of 419 when we are scanning our complete table. And we're retrieving 157 rows out of 80,000 with a bookmark lookup. We have already 334 page reads. A scan costs us 419. When we retrieve one more record, we're scanning that table. Just think about that. We have a table in front of us with 80,000 records. We have an index on our search predicate value where we've done 150 rows, 158, and SQL Server isn't using our non clustered index anymore. So the smaller your records are, the more useless your non clustered index is, as long as they are not a current non clustered index. So think about that. We're still dealing with the same amount of rules, 80,000. The only thing that we have changed is the size of those rules. Okay? So again, we have almost two identical queries, but two different execution plans, based on the dipping point. Before the dipping point, SQL Server makes a bookmark lookup. After the dipping point, we're just scanning the whole table, and again, we have a predicate 
which discards non-qualified moves. Okay. Questions? Who has already seen that behavior? Let's start about parameter sniffing. Who knows parameter sniffing? Almost everyone. So I can skip it. No. <laughs> Just kidding. When we are working, for example, with stored procedures, and we first execute our stored procedure, for example, when we are restarting SQL Server, when we have performed the failover in the clustering environment, SQL Server compiles in the first step an execution plan. And that execution plan is based on the input parameter that we are providing. Means SQL Server sniffs the value of our input parameter and based on that input parameter SQL Server compiles an execution plan. And afterwards we are running that compiled plan. Maybe with a different runtime value of that parameter. So we are dealing with two kinds of parameter values. With a so -called run uh, we have a so-called compile time value. That's the value for which that stored procedure, for which that execution plan was optimized for. And in addition, we have a runtime value. The value with which we are currently running that cached compiled plan means when those values are different and we have an uneven data distribution, we can have a parameter sniffing program. Imagine in the first step, you are using a value which returns very, very few rows. All your customers from Austria. Just a few crazy people. When you have a non-covering, non-clustered index, SQL Server has to perform a bookmark lookup. Means SQL Server caches that plan. And afterwards, you're returning with that cached plan all your customers from Poland. Not very selective. Maybe you have 95% of your customers in Poland. Means SQL Server uses that cached plan with the bookmark lookup and is doing the bookmark lookup over and over and over and over again. SQL Server isn't making here any thinking. SQL Server just uses, reuses the cached plan without thinking what crazy stuff he is doing. We're just reusing that cached plan. That's a very, very huge problem. When I am seeing performance problems, mainly 80% of those performance problems are based on parameter sniffing in combination with bookmark lookups. So that's just a traditional problem that you're always seeing in SQL Server. So we just execute a suboptimal plan, means our I.O. costs are exploding. Because you have to do that bookmark lookup over and over and over again. I've already seen execution plans which cost page reads of 100 gigabytes with a database of 10 gigabytes. Because you're doing that bookmark lookup over and over and over again. So your page reads are just exploding. Question is how we can resolve that. The easiest way is to define a covering non-clustered index, means your bookmark lookup is gone. Of course, in some cases, it's not possible to select star. You can't cover that. Of course, you can cover it. But then you have a non-clustered index where you have your data, data where, you, where you have your data duplicated. But for example, with LOB columns, you can't include them. So in some cases, you still have to deal with that bookmark lookup. For that reason, SQL Server provides us some query hints. So we can hint the query optimizer to tell the query optimizer which plan we want to have. So we are just overruling the query optimizer. Not really a smart idea, because normally the query optimizer is smarter than we. Okay. Of course, SQL Server provides us also multiple choice flags. I think SQL Server has more logic regarding trace flags 
accept other things. So when you are working a little bit more with the query optimizer, I think they have hundreds of different twist flags. Just crazy. What query hints we have? We compile. Instead of using the cached plan, we are just recompiling the plan so that we are getting a new one and the new one is optimized for the current input parameter values that we are currently providing. So the first step when you are retrieving all your customers from Austria, we are getting a bookmark lookup. Very, very selective result. When we are returning all our customers from Poland, it was a recompasted plan and we are getting a table or clustered index scan because we are over the dipping point. Very simple solution. With also the optimized query hint, we can tell the query optimizer to optimize that specific plan for a specific input value. So when you know you are almost always querying for your customers in Poland, because your customers in Austria are not very important, you can tell SQL Server, when I'm running that query, please compile me an execution plan which returns me all the customers from Poland. So in that case, SQL Server generates a plan with a scan instead of a bookmark lookup. Means, when you're requesting all your customers from Austria, SQL Server still returns you a plan with a scan. Of course, you really have to know your data, you really have to know your data distribution, and you really have to know when your data changes. Imagine I'm convincing you Austria is a great company, and tomorrow you are starting a marketing campaign in Austria, and you are getting 10,000 new, uh, 10, new customers. In that case, when you are querying again for all your customers in Austria, it's not very selective anymore. You are returning a huge amount. In that case, the optimized query hint is still used by SQL Server. So if you are using query hints, you really have to know your data. Because you are just overruling the query optimizer, which means the query optimizer might provide you a better plan, but he isn't allowed for it. Okay? So we should not use too much query hints. Only in specific cases when there is no way out anymore. There are also other resolutions like TraceFlag 4136, which completely disables parameter sniffing. Not really recommended because you're getting bad plans. Let's have a look on those things. Creating a new database. I'm creating a very simple table. And I'm inserting some rows into that table. When we look into that table, you can see that we have in column 2 an uneven data distribution. We have one record with the value of 1. That's your custom in Austria. And you have 1,499 rows with the value of 2. That's all your customers from program. Just an uneven data distribution. We have in every database uneven data distribution. That's a simple fact. Your da our data isn't evenly distributed. We just have always to deal with, with uneven data distributions. And now we create a non-clustered index on that column too. We create a simple stored procedure. Nothing special about that. Just a simple stored procedure, input parameter. We are returning all the records where column 2 equals the parameter value. Nothing special about that. Almost as easy as the stored procedure from yesterday when I've talked about MDB. Nothing special about the fix that I'm presenting. Okay? Now we are running that stored procedure. We are returning all our customers from Austria. Very, very selective. We just have one customer in Austria. So, bookmark lookup. Makes sense. We are returning one row. Actual numbers of rows one. 
means we're performing that bookmark lookup once. So we have here page reads, large empty reads of three. For example, when we are running a complete scan of that table, we have large empty reads of four. Just think about it. Normally we are saying a scan is bad because a scan doesn't scale with the amount of data. The more data we have in that table, the longer the scan takes. Scans can be very, very nice, as you will see in a few seconds. And now, we want to return all our customers from Poland, 1,499. Which execution plan is used? The same execution plan. We are just reusing the cached plan. The cached plan which is optimized to return that one crazy guy from Austria. We're just reusing the cached plan. When you're dealing with stored procedures, the cache key that SQL Server is evaluating is just a number, uh, it's just the name of the stored procedure which we've data in our case. So as you can see, index seek non clustered estimated numbers with rules one. Crazy guy from Austria, actual numbers of rows 1499. <coughs> Means for every row, we have to perform our bookmark lookup. Actual numbers of executions 1499. Just think about that. And our IO costs are exploding. We have page widths of 1505. A complete scan of the table costs us four page reads. Just think about that. We are dealing with a sub-optimal execution plan. When we look at that plan on the select operator, you can see we have here a parameter list. With our value, parameter value, and we have a compile time value and a runtime value. The plan is compiled and optimized for the value of 1. And currently we are running that plan with a value of 2. Barometer sniffing program. Microsoft is telling us that's a feature. I'm telling you that's a bug. Okay? Just one Yeah, of course. Of course, when you are lucky, and we delete the plan cache, and you retrieve in the first step all your customers from Poland, you are getting a scan. Means, when we are retrieving the one who is a guy from Austria, you are reusing the scan, and the scan just costs you four. Means, when you are lucky, you are getting a table or clustered index scan, means your performance is always worse, always the same worse, we're just performing the scan. When you are unlucky and you are first getting a bookmark lookup, you can't predict your performance anymore because it depends how many rows you are returning through that artificial execution plan. So think about that. Sometimes people are telling me, our queries are sometimes fast and slow. Bookmark lookups. <clears throat> then we restart our SQL Server or we, we, or we perform a failover and the performance is again good. Of course. When you are lucky and you first get a table scan or a clustered index scan, you can predict your performance. But with a bookmark lookup in the execution plan, you can't predict it anymore. Okay? So I'm always hearing that our queries are sometimes fast, sometimes slow, then we are restarting SQL Server and everything is fine. I'm always saying, come on, tell me something different. Almost hearing that every week. How can we solve that problem? We've recompiled. The easiest thing would be to create for that query covering non classic or to up the non cluster. Of course, here with a select star, creating a covering non clustered index isn't the best idea. We 
because we have to duplicate every data, every column in the non-cluster. So what I'm doing, I'm dropping this dot procedure. All our problems are done. No, we just recreate it. We recreate it, and what I'm doing, I'm declaring here a variable and assigning the variable the input parameter value. And afterwards, in the select query, I'm referencing that, oops, I'm referencing that variable. A variable is a runtime construct. It means when the query optimizer compiles the plan for that single statement, the query optimizer has no idea which value we have in that variable because the variable doesn't exist here in compile time. So the question is, how can we produce an execution plan? You have no idea how many rows are we dumped. <coughs> so let's run it. Crazy guy from Austria. Table scan. Estimated numbers of rows 750. Any idea how Sigurdsson is making that estimation? From statistics, these values. Which value? Of course, it must come from the statistics. The density. We have a table with 1,500 rows, and in column two, we have two distinct values. The value of one, the value of two, means we have a density of 0.5. 1,500 rows multiplied by 0.5 equals 750 rows. With 750 rows, we are over the dipping point, means SQL Server scans our whole table. So it really depends again on the density of that column on the data distribution. Which execution plan you are getting when you are working with local variable. All our customers from Poland, table scan. Estimation 750, actual numbers of rows almost 1500. I'm not a big fan of that. So let's drop it. Another option. We can recompile our stored procedure every time when we execute that stored procedure. Means we are getting every time a perfect plan. One row, very, very selective, bookmark lookup. All our customers from Poland, not really selective anymore, they will scan. So we're just recompiling every time that plan and the side effect that plan isn't cached anymore because it doesn't make sense to cache something when we're just recompiling it every time. Is this a good approach to use recompile with recompile? Not really. We are recompiling our whole stored procedure. Imagine you have 100 or more statements in that stored procedure. You're recompiling the whole thing. Maybe you have just in one specific statement in that huge stored procedure a parameter sniffing program. For that reason, we have since SQL Server 2005 a so-called statement level recompilation. It means we are just recompiling the specific statement instead of the whole stored procedure. Option recompile. Means when we are executing that stored procedure, the first select statement gets a cached plan, which we are just blindly reusing, and the second statement, the plan always is recompiled. First execution, customers from Austria, two times, of course, index seek with bookmark looker, very, very selective result. Second execution, all our customers from Poland, the first part, the first select statement, the plan is just reused. Same problem as previously. And the second part is recompiled. The statement level recompilation. And that's our friend.
when we are not able to change our non plastic index. The root cause is the bad non plastic index, the bad select star query, which produces the book number code. So, normally, you should always try to fix that root cause. Okay? If you aren't able to fix that root cause, maybe that query is coming from a third party application which you can't influence, then you can work with a statement level recompilation to get rid of that problem. Make sense? What else can we do? Crazy things. Optimize for. We're telling the query optimizer we want to have an execution plan which is optimized for the input value of 1. Regardless which parameter value we are providing the first time when we're executing that stored procedure. All our customers from Poland. We expect a table scan because it's not very selective. But in reality we are getting back a bookmark lookup. Just think about that. We are overruling the query optimizer. We are telling the query optimizer we are almost every time expecting that we are running that stored procedure with a value of 1. Therefore, we want to have that stored procedure optimized for a value of 1, regardless what we are really doing. As I've said earlier, you really have to know your data. You really have to know your data. When your data distribution changes, when your underlying data changes, you also have to change that query hint. The query optimizer isn't allowed anymore to produce any other executable plan. You're just telling the query optimizer, please produce me, please compile me an execution plan which is optimized for the value of 1. If you are returning millions, billions of rows, query optimizer doesn't care. We are telling SQL Server, we are smarter than you. Just think about that. Go to Bob Ward and tell him we are smarter than all your cool people. <laughs> Even when I'm talking to Bob, I'm telling him you are smarter than me. So if you are doing that, you really have to be very, very careful what you are doing. Okay? Imagine the following. Optimize for unknown. We have no idea what we are doing. <laughs> Just think about that. Optimize for unknown. We want to travel to GPT. You have no idea where GPT is. Optimize, query optimize, please produce us an execution plan. with an estimation again of 750 rows. The so SQL Server is just using the density vector of the underlying statistics object. So he is a little bit smarter. He isn't really producing always a data scan. It again depends on the density of the data distribution of the underlying data. But optimize for unknown, I'm not a big fan of it. We have no idea why should the query optimizer have what we want. <coughs> and now I'm recreating the original stored procedure definition. Stored procedure with which we have started. Imagine that stored procedure is part of a third part of the application, badly written application like SharePoint, dynamic CRM a lot of different Microsoft products we can refer to or we are not allowed to change the storage procedure definition for example because of service level agreements what can we do to improve the performance 
We know we have a parameter sniffing problem. We are not allowed to change this procedure. What can we do? Trace map. We are not allowed to add an index. We're changing the database schema. Not okay. supported. Trace flags are added. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, option we can buy, but I'm not allowed to change the start procedure. Okay. Chicken egg problem. We can use plan guides. Plan guides. We can use a plan guide. Of course, you have read it already. <laughs> As we create a plan guide with a plan guide, we can attach any query hint to any specific statement that we are executing on our single instance without changing the statement. Plan guide has a name for a specific statement, for example, in the stored procedure, and then we are just providing hints. We can provide any hint. For example, option we compile, optimize for unknown, we can hint the query optimizer to use hash charts, we can do everything. Every query hint that is part of SQL Server can be attached by blank guides. We're not changing the start procedure, we're just attaching a blank guide to it. A blank guide is a native database object. So when we go to Object Explorer, <coughs> You can see programmability of one database. With here our blank guide. Means when you're doing a backup of that database, when you're restoring that database, you have your blank guide. It's just a native database object. <coughs> Means we're optimizing now that specific statement in our stored procedure for the value of one without touching that statement in that specific stored procedure. Means, when we are running again that stored procedure, all our customers from Poland, we expect that they will scan, SQL Server gives us a bookmark lookup. You can drive people crazy with that thing. You can do everything. You can do all the various locking hints, join hints, everything. You can drive people crazy. You can even fake with some combinations of query hints, empty tables. You can do everything. But just think about it. <coughs> Don't overdo it. Only that's also a last resort when we can't change anything and we still have to fix that performance problem. But again, we're just influencing in a completely transparent fashion the query optimizer. Because when we are still, when we are still looking on our stored procedure, nothing has changed. But we're getting a completely different execution plan. Of course, when we're looking on the actual plan here, we see that the plan guide was used. Okay? So we can see it why we have here a bad plan. And when we don't need the plan guide anymore, we can drop it. Questions on that? So as you see, a very, very simple start procedure with a lot of different performance groups. Let's start in the end about bookmark lookup deadlocks. When we have an execution plan with a bookmark lookup and we have a concurrent execution plan which is changing our clustered index and in addition our non-clustered index, we can have deadlocks. Bookmark lookup deadlocks. Just think about that. Another side effect that we're just introducing with bookmark lookup in SQL Server. The problem that we have when we are performing a bookmark lookup in our select execution plan, in our read execution plan, 
we have to acquire a shared log on the index C to non cluster. And afterwards, we also have to acquire a shared log on the clustered <coughs> index when we are performing the bookmark lookup. When we are running concurrently a write activity and the timing is perfect, we can have a deadlock because we have to acquire an exclusive lock on the clustered index when we are changing the clustered index. And if you are in addition changing the non-clustered, you also need an exclusive lock on the non-clustered <coughs> index. Means, when the timing is perfect, both activities are just blocking each other. Read activity waits on the write activity, write activity waits on the read activity. That lock. So you have a bookmark lookup plan and you have a write activity, for example, which changes the clustering key value. When you're changing the clustering key value, you have to change your clustered index and in addition you also have to change your non-clustered index because the non-clustered index has the clustering key value at least in the leaf level as a logical pointer. So both execution plans are just deadlocking against each other. Very simple to reproduce. Let's create a new database. Let's create a simple table. I have a primary key, primary key cluster. Creating a non cluster on column 3. Inserting a few, or well, just one record. Simplest table in CSO. And I have here a simple statement which changes our clustering key value, which is a very, very bad idea. The clustered key value should be always static, because when we are running that statement, you have to change your clustered index. And as you can see, we have the change of the clustered index. And in addition, we have the change of our non-clustered index. Because in the non-clustered, we have the clustering key value and the leaf level as a logical pointer. Okay, so we have an exclusive lock on the clustered index, on the row, and also in the non-clustered index. I have here a second session, which uses that database, and I'm producing here a bookmark lookup. I'm hinting SQL Server to use the non-clustered because we've run row SQL Server, otherwise we'd perform a table scan. So just two different execution plans means when we are running them concurrently, they will deadlock. The only thing that I'm making here, I'm helping SQL Server. I'm setting the transaction isolation level to repeatable read so that my read activity is holding the shared logs until the end of our transaction. If you have a real production workload, it's also possible to read completely. I'm just helping SQL Server here in both sessions. So we are running forever our wet activity and we are also running in repeatable read forever our read activity. Now we are waiting for a few seconds. Boom! Could we be completed with errors? Deadlock. SQL Server we have the so-called deadlock monitor runs every few seconds. Deadlock monitor goes to the lock manager and just has a look on the current held locks and just checks if we have a deadlock situation. If a deadlock situation is, the cheapest transaction is look back. The cheapest transaction is the transaction which produces the least amount of transaction log records in the transaction log. Means our select query because the select query doesn't produce anything in the transaction log. As you can see when we're going down, we have a nice, nice deadlock error. Means both processes are just deadlocking each other. Another side effect of the bookmark lookup in our execution plan. So as you can see, ex uh, as you can see, bookmark lookups are really, really, really 
dangerous in SQL Server. Cool. Who of you likes Ukma Plukas? The question was, what is about read committed snapshot as a reason? Good input. Your deadlocks will be gone. Read committed snapshot isolation, new isolation level that was introduced back with SQL Server 2005, and it's a deadlock killer. Because with read committed snapshot isolation, readers are not acquiring shared blocks anymore because they are going into the version store and the public toilet of SQL Server, MDP, means when you have a workload which has a huge amount of deadlocks, just enable read committed snapshot isolation and almost all deadlocks are just gone because we have no shared locks anymore. So that's also another transparent option. How do we avoid deadlocks in SQL Server? Just use optimistic concurrency, read committed snapshot isolation. It's just a database option. We don't have to change our workload. We're just running with an optimistic implementation of read committed. Other questions? What about dynamic executions uh, inside so procedure uh, to avoid uh, such uh, parameter sniffing? Uh, yes, because with dynamic uh, SQL, for, for example, SP execute SQL, you're getting for every. Uh, no! You have still the same problem. You still have the same problem. The plan which you are producing dynamically, or the statement that you are producing dynamically on the first execution, the query optimizer generates a plan and that plan is again cache. The only advantage that you have is that you are getting for every different dynamic SQL statement a different execution plan. But when you are reusing that plan again with different values, same behavior as previously. You just have a parameter sniffing problem, which you have introduced dynamically. Okay. Other questions? Cool. So what we have seen in the last hour, we have started with bookmark lookups. As you have seen, bookmark lookups are really, it's a really, really nice concept to retrieve additional data, which isn't part of the non clustered index, with a huge amount of side effects. We have seen the dipping point, means the number of data pages are defining if SQL Server performs a bookmark lookup, or a table, or a clustered index can, means when we are using inside stored procedures, or even with uh, parameterized SQL statements, Different execution plans, we can again introduce huge side effects regarding performance problems. Because SQL Server compiles for the first execution and execution plan, and that plan is just reused. Means when the compile time and runtime value of your queries are different, we have a huge performance problem. And finally, as we have seen, it's also very, very easy to get into a deadlock situation when you have a read and write activity which accesses concurrently your clustered and non-clustered index. So if there are no questions anymore, thanks for attending my talk. It's my last talk, so if we don't see each other anymore, enjoy the rest of your life. Thank you. <laughs>